Welcome to the Primetime Podcast. This is Primetime James Thomas coming at you with another edition of our coverage of the Vince McMahon documentary called Mr. McMahon, which aired in September 25th on Netflix. Now, in this episode, we will talk about Vince McMahon's relationship with various women. So this is the the crux of the documentary for a lot of people. This is the this is the jumping on point. This is lawsuits, exploitation, affairs, manipulations, all these sorts of things that took place d- within the six part series. You get a lot of conversation about Vince and women. Most notably, how Vince uses them as on-screen characters and some of the situations he dealt with off-screen. Now, as usual, there were things missing from this section. Of uh, Noticeably absent was the Fabulous Moolah, Mae Young, and China. These were three people that were very important who were absent. Fabulous Mula used to provide the talent for WWF Women's Division. Of course, of course, she's trained these women. There's a lot of stuff about her too, but they didn't. But they decided not to talk about that. Where they where they could have connected Vince with the abuse of some of the women who were trained by Fabulous Mula, how she took advantage of them. Whether, whether it was sexually or financially, whatever. But I'm honestly surprised they decided to withhold uh, their uh, disgust for that. So, so that was absent. The China situation. Of all the wrestlers that, should, that the show that passed away, China was not one of them. She was not even mentioned. She was not mentioned in the Stephanie Triple H relationship part, which plays a very important role. She was not in, she was not mentioned in that in the attitude era where she also played a very important role. Uh, China not being mentioned was very suspicious to me. But we got everybody else. We got Rita Chatterton, Janelle Grant, Ashley Mazzaro, Sable, Trish Stratus, and all these come with their own baggage. They even mentioned Nancy Argentino in the story at one point. And Rita Chatterton, of course, is the big one that that is mentioned in the one serious issue that they talk about. They don't talk about it. At, they don't talk about it at length. They pretty much play Rita's appearance on Geraldo. That's pretty much all what they do, and the accusation that she that she put out there, and Vince responded to it. So those who we're not familiar. Rita Chatterton claimed she was forced to perform oral sex on Vince, and he forcefully um, applied himself to her. She went on television, supposedly about five, six years later after the affair, went on Geraldo Rivera and said she was raped by Vince McMahon. Now, Vince's response was it was bullcrap and that the affair was consensual. And then he, instead of stopping right there, he said, even if it was rape, the statute of limitations have run out. And an untold number of sites just clipped out, if it were rape, the statute of limitations ran out. This is why this... This is where I get very agitated about women's issues because people get really sensitive about it and they take things out of context. A lot of it being consensual was left out. Now, if you didn't watch the entire thing, that part is almost glossed over. But they do mention later in the episode that New York City that uh, that goes at New York City law goes after accusers, no matter how long long ago the crime was. And Vince settled with Rita Chatterton. And 
it's an interesting situation. Because for a long time, only a few people, only a few people believe Rich Hatton's story. She waited six years, and the reason why she waited six years didn't make any sense. It was like she was friends with Andre the Giant, and she wanted to wait till Andre passed away first. And what, what the hell? So this wasn't a this wasn't as big or a part of the this wasn't as a big of a story that I thought it was going to be. But it set the table because at this point. We're in episode two. We're, we're talking about Rita Chatterton. Where we talk about Rita Chatterton. It's also episode two where we talk about Jimmy Snuka and Nancy Argentino being beaten to death, and this plays into the larger context of Tony Atlas when he said how they abused they abused all the women, how they mistreated all the women, all of them did, and that of course sets the stage that. Women has been mis- has been mistreated throughout the throughout the entire entirety of the WWE. Let me fast forward to the Attitude Era. And episode four comes on comes along, and now we're talking about exploiting women in the content. You know the brawny panty matches, the bikini contests, and all this stuff. And everyone's there. Talking about WWF's drastic change in demographics. They're no longer trying to appeal to children. They're now trying to appeal to older college age males, 18 to 34. An 18 to 34 year old male is interested in women. The sexier the product, the better the product. The more that was shown, the more interest the males had. Dave Melter comes in and starts talking about Sable. That Sable was one of the top draws in the Attitude Era. And her segments did big numbers right up there with Stone Cold Steve Austin's. And, of course, we all know Sable ended up suing the WWF or E, for sexual harassment. But they didn't contextualize the sexual harassment lawsuit. It's, no, it's, not one, it's not one of those things where at the end it says the WWE settled their, they settled their lawsuit with Rena, with Rena Merrow, well now Rena Lesnar. But they left out the part about how, why she sued for wrestle harassment and it wasn't just sexual harassment either. It was unsafe working conditions, unfair practices, a bunch of other stuff too. Um, her chief complaint was wasn't even really sexual harassment. That was that was the craziest part people clanged on to. Her real issue was she wanted to go to the movies, and WWE controlled the intellectual property of Sable, and they did not want her to go into movies. So she sued in order to get out of her contract. And she tried to go to try to go to movies. She tried to go to WCW. When that stuff didn't work, she came back. But the sexual harassment part, and, and apparently there, there was probably two, three parts of that. Part one was that she was asked to be in a lesbian storyline, which she declined. Two was that she was pitched an idea in which she would accidentally, on purpose, have her top ripped off or her gown ripped off, or something to that effect in a segment that would lead to a feud with Deborah, or something to that effect. And the third one was that there were men coming into lo- there was men coming into the women's locker room, which of course could have been writers, but it's a lawsuit, so it's written to be salacious as possible. Of course, Sable came back in 2003. MILF Sable. Vince, when asked about Sable in the lawsuit, that Sable filed, he says he doesn't remember anything about Sable's lawsuit. But she came back to work, so not a big deal, right? And this is where I call BS on Vince. 
I call I call BS on Vince on that because Vince remembers a lot. He I know there's sometimes that people say that he's 80. How much how much of the stuff can he really the, the, how much of these stuff can he really remember? Can, can he really remember? Does he have dementia? Does he have a brain disorder? But not remember not remembering this lawsuit when he had to know it was coming up. I mean, it's it's tactical. Now why would I, why would I say it's tactical? Who's his buddy? Brock Lesnar. And he's Brock and who's Brock Lesnar's wife? Sable? Yes, Sable. So, of course he's not going to say anything bad about Sable. He's going to pretend I don't I don't remember, I don't remember anything about that. I don't know anything about a lawsuit. BS. It it's very suspicious that the one lawsuit that involves one of your really good friends' wives, you don't remember that. BS. You don't remember that one. You remember everything else but that one. Okay. Now, Trish Stratus was a very interesting case. Trish was a lot, a lot more lenient, but it still had the same boundaries. Trish Stratus, in my opinion, did a really good job of humanizing Vince and humanizing what they do making sense of what they do. The segment where she had, where, of course, the infamous bark like a dog segment. Trish, of course, tells not the entire story, but she discusses how she became Vince McMahon's on-screen mistress. Basically, it wasn't pitched to her that she was going to be Vince, Vince's mistress. It sort of just evolved into that because back then... Back then, Attitude Era was was booked week to week. It wasn't about long term storytelling like it is now. It was it was a very week to week process. You now, how can we take this character and do this this week? And it became, <coughs> excuse me, and it became a very long storyline between Vince, Trish, Shane, and Stephanie and Linda. <clears throat> So it wasn't pitched to her that she was going to be one of be one one of Vince's many on screen mistresses, but she knew that the comeuppance was going to happen, and that the barking like a dog segment was the lead up to that story. Now, for anybody who I don't know that's familiar with stories, you know that sometimes characters are humiliated, characters are demeaned, and they get their revenge later on in the story, which. Trish knew that they were going to do that, that she was going to get her revenge later. It wasn't going to go unpunished. But I particularly love the discussion about disgust. And that disgust becomes, it's an emotion just like anger, sadness. And sometimes you could be just, ugh, this is sick, right? This is disgusting, right? It's evil, it's vile. And soap operas are like that. Soap operas are filled with evil, vile, sick people. But you continue to follow it, though. And you continue to follow their lives and their adventures and their exploits. And the Vince McMahon, Trish Stratus, Linda situation was one of those disgusting things. Where you got this guy and his, and his wife is in a wheelchair. He's, she's catatonic and he's abusing her. And it was interesting to me that a lot of the story for the documentary was, was asking who is Vince McMahon, what's the difference between Vince McMahon and Mr. McMahon. And wrestling always has people quite in the middle, always. So people see this stuff, that Vince is cheating on Linda, that Vince is using the talent to cheat on Linda. And they say this is a, re a reflection of the real world. This is a reflection of the real situations that, that's occurring. And Vince is denying it, of course. No, it's all just character. It's all storylines. It's entertainment. It's not a big deal. Even though he's had on-screen affairs with a lot of different women. Which, of course, became the Vince McMahon character as being as this licentious... Uh, exploitive, abusive male figure on the show that is now as abusive and exploitive 
in real life as well. But Trish understood that, that, that they were telling a story, and they were using people's legitimate disgust at Vince's real life. People like it when it's real. It's his real wife. It wouldn't have worked as well if it wasn't Linda. But Trish, being the person that was in that position, understood what they were trying to do. And trying to explain it to outsiders, it's like, it's really, it's really awkward because I've never seen this for actors in movies or anything like that. Most people just, they write off wrestling as it's just acting, it's not real, why do you watch this stuff, it's fake. But then when something happens on screen, like somebody's wife kissing somebody else, it becomes, how can you do that? That's your daughter. That's your wife. This is your real wife. It becomes, but it's fake. It's not real. The kiss might be real, but it's acting. It's Hollywood. People, other people get that type, other people get that stuff mixed in. It wasn't like Vince had Trish in the locker room on her knees barking like a dog. It was a segment in the middle of the ring. Now, the Jimbo quote, and I don't like Dave Meltzer. I, I can't stand I can't stand Dave Meltzer. But a gem of a quote that Dave Meltzer said in this documentary was let me let me find an actual quote. Meltzer says, quote, I didn't like it, but I saw it at the time that the audience was young men who fantasized about hot women. Also kind of hated them. Because they could never get with them. So seeing them being demeaned was kind of perfect. That's his view of the Barking Like a Dog segment. And there was some human thumb there by, by the name of Sherry Mazur, a writer, I guess. Um, she's interested in wrestling, a fan. Arlo couldn't stand her. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. And she talked about how the complexity of the story that I was very interested in, because as Vince is demeaning this young woman, quote unquote, getting heat, because he's mistreating her, he's also getting over with the audience because he's giving the male demographic what they want, which is Trish naked. They want to see Trish naked. They're not really caring about how we got there, right? So I understood that, and I under and I liked that juxtaposition, and I like that argument. And that's pro wrestling in a nutshell. That's movie and TV in a nutshell. You may get what you want, but it's not the way that you want it. Yeah, you want to see Trish naked whatsoever, but you really don't want to see her on her knees barking like a dog, man. Kicked around like by Mr. McMahon. And for Meltzer to, I guess, psychoanalyze people he never met to say that, oh, they hated women anyway. It's like, no, this is the tone of the 90s. This was the tone of movies and television anyway. There were a lot of male humiliation too, which people don't talk about. A lot of humili male humiliation, whether in a storyline with Vince or, or not. Vince himself has been humiliated on television. They didn't discuss at all Stone Cold Steve Austin making him make Vince piss on himself. I mean, with that is the most ultimate humiliation. Vince's various ass whoopings that he catches from other wrestlers, you know, the Kiss My Ass Club, all these sorts of things that the the reaction that the reaction isn't the same. Like, 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 it's okay, you know, if the male goes through it, but if a woman is, if, but if a woman's being forced against her will, it's different. Or they're held hostage or something to that effect. The same sympathy they applied for Trish, they didn't apply for Shawn Michaels being forced to kiss Vince McMahon's ass, which is the same thing. The point of it was to feel sympathy for Sean. You know, that's the point. The point 
of Stone Cold Steve Austin hunting Vince McMahon down and forcing him to piss himself was different. It's a humiliation ritual for sure. But the difference is for Stone Cold Steve Austin to get some level of revenge on Vince for all for all the slights that Vince has put Austin through. So humiliation is a completely, totally different and valid storyline element. And Trish was very mature in understanding that. And a lot of other people seem to be immature because they don't understand it. Trish Stratus also, interesting enough, said that she was pitched a storyline to kiss another woman, and she refused. And then she ended up losing her title a short time later. I'm sure it was the Mickey James. If, if I had to guess it was the Mickey James thing. I'm, I'm sure it was the Mickey James thing. And Trish was like, wait a minute, is it because I said no to this story or whatever? You'll never know. I, I don't think so, but you never know what Vince. So the Trish Stratus part of the story was very interesting. In episode six, we get to Ashley Mazzaro. Now they mention Ashley Mazzaro's, the Ashley Mazzaro's story about her being raped in the Middle East and the, and the WWF covering it up apparently. And then the follow-up story where... Ashley claims that she was demeaned in storylines after turning down sexual advances from Vince. And they show clips of Ashley and Vince on television doing an angle where she mistakenly spilled coffee on Vince and Vince overreacted and suspended her and all this kind of stuff. Episode six is probably the one episode. Now, Episode six, because all before this, I was like, okay, I don't see why Vince was tripping. But shout out to Ben, who was one of the people I talked to in Discord. He said it's one hundred percent episode six. It was episode six that did it, because episode six did was where they did the most damage to Vince's reputation overtly. Because they want to spend all their time talking about the various lawsuits and NDAs and etc. That it makes sense too. And because Vince and the family and literally nobody else except maybe Bruce was even evolved in the later portions of the, of the documentary. In episode six, Vince almost vanishes completely. And they continue for 30 minutes with nobody saying anything contrary to what the documentary was putting out there about Ash Bizarro. You know, they just say the company denied it. And they just move on. But they stack it on top of the Janelle Grant thing and the other NDAs. And they're stacking it with clips of Vince being, being flirtatious with other women. Creating this portrait that there's this culture of women being abused and women being not taken, not taken seriously within the WWE. It came across as very much like this portion of the documentary is meant to be used as evidence against Vince McMahon in the upcoming lawsuit or federal case whatsoever. But let's put everything in one central place. Every accusation with no, rep with no reputations put in place. Again, Constantine Cairo is a con man, the, the attorney for Ashley Mazzaro during the concussion lawsuit, which would have been interesting. Had they mentioned that Ash Mazzaro's statement was during a concussion lawsuit and not a standalone sexual harassment or rape lawsuit, it was during a concussion lawsuit. And then the letter, they did say this, it cost in Cairo's, the con man put out there, is that 10 years after the fact, these things... They just rolled it all together because it was in the news at the time. When it popped up in the news, they just threw it in the documentary. They didn't... Fun, funny enough, the documentary apparently was complete before... Like, like apparently this, this, this documentary was completed before... Before... 
the Ash Bizarro thing was even completely, I, I think some sort of uh, media, media, media site even put it out there. Probably it was complete before then. Which, of course, I didn't find anything because it was 20 years later whatsoever. I mean, what can you find? Or what do you expect to find? So, not much there. They mentioned the tanning salon situation. Apparently, they didn't ask Vince about it because there's no commentary from Vince about it. Even though it would have happened long before he did the sit-down interview, which means he could have asked him about it. And this is where episode 6 kind of really aggravates because Ashley Mazzaro happened at a time where you could when you were speaking to Vince in 2021 you could have asked him about Ashley you could have asked him about the tanning salon situation there's a lot of things that they could have asked him about that was in episode 6 that they didn't ask him about and they didn't show any footage or any re or any refutation of from the other side Nobody said anything. They just started piling on all these accusations. The tanning salon, Ashley, the NDAs. Now, not the NDAs and the Janelle Grant. He's not going to talk about those anyway because that's ongoing in litigation. He's not going to talk about that. Okay, I get that. The NDAs, he's put out statements on those already. He could have, you, you could read his statement. You could, you, they could have read his statements, but I don't believe they did. But the tanning salon situation where he supposedly showed naked pictures of himself to a woman and Asha Mazzaro, who apparently claimed she was raped overseas. They could have asked Vince about this, but they didn't. They had the time and opportunity to do that, and they didn't. I don't like where you could throw something, unless he was dead. If he was dead, there's nothing you could do about it. But he's very much alive. And you spent all this time on Montreal Screwjob and Monday Night War, but we're not gonna get around to. Hey Vince, what happened to that? What happened to that tanning salon in two thousand six? Hey Vince, I heard about this story about Ash Mazzaro with this young lady. Whatever happened to her? No, now we're just we get twenty minutes of Shoemaker and Wall Street Journal reporters talking about things, and there's no response. From the other side, no response outside of corporate statements. And I'm, and I'm not saying you should put. I'm, I'm not saying you should put those things in there. But I just think the Ash Mazzaro story is important. Is important enough for you to put in there? The tanning salon story, like the Rita Chatterton story, is important to put in there. The question, my problem is, did you not ask him? Or did you ask him and then cut the response? That's something I'm very interested in. And then also, everything else that happened was happening in a timeline. There was a very linear timeline. There was, there was a very linear way they could have developed the story. They start from Vince's childhood all the way to Vince's accusations and what he stopped participating. The tanning salon situation was in 2006. That was before Chris Benoit even happened. You could have talked about that even before we got to Chris Benoit. The, the situation with Ashley, it happened 10 years later in 2017. And both those situations, you could have discussed with him what happened, what was going on, what are his thoughts about those things. Instead, it was all dumped into a part of the story where he was no longer participating in, and apparently nobody else was either. An interesting quote that Vince says during the Rita Chatterton portion was, once you're accused of rape, you're a rapist. This is an axiom that everybody knows to be true. Our society believes every single rape accusation, unless it's against a favorable, favorable, like a Joe Biden or something like that, or a Bill Clinton. Otherwise, most people consider if, if they said it was rape, it was rape, whether they could prove it or not. But we live in a situation where people have been accused of, even in some cases, convicted of rape. And it didn't really damage their legacy at all. Kobe Bryant, for example, it destroyed Bill Cosby. 
it didn't destroy, it re- didn't really hurt Kobe Bryant, you know. Um, it's going to destroy Vince McMahon, but how much done damage did it do? But how much damage did it do to the legacy of Tupac Shakur? Almost none. So, our, obviously, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, all these people, Puffy recently. This is now the class that Vince McMahon has pushed into. And I think it's very unfair to do that. Especially since, unlike Bill Cosby and Tupac Shakur and Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, he hasn't been found guilty of these crimes yet. And I say yet because who knows what could happen in 10 years. It seems unfair to me that that's the direction that everybody's going. That he is some sort some type of serial rapist. He's certainly flirtatious. There's certainly lust in his eyes when it comes to women. Look, many a great man has done many a great things, has been destroyed by poor dick, dick discipline. R. Kelly, for example. The ego gets out of control. The rich and powerful. You're in contact with beautiful women all the time, and you have poor dick discipline. And that's the story of Vince McMahon going all the way back to the 80s, all the way back to Rita Chatterton, even before that. Him cheating on Vince on Linda McMahon all the time, which caused this problem that he's in right now. Even though I am somewhat sympathetic to that, admittedly, I'm not going to say he didn't do anything wrong. If Vince McMahon had been a perfectly normal person with good dick discipline, who did not step out of his marriage as many times as he has, who was not, you know, so involved with his own gimmick, they started to believe it. He wouldn't be in these situations. Most of these situations, at least. The situation with Rita Chatterton would have never happened because he was married because Rita Chat before Rita Chatterton came into his life. The tanning salon, maybe so there's some misunderstanding. We don't really know what happened. But the situation with Janelle Grant and the NDAs, none of this stuff happens. If he's a, if he is a quiet, under the radar monk of a man who grows old like every other normal person, but he's not. He is Vince is different, and because he's different, he finds himself in these weird situations where his mind, one of his two brains that he talks about, is thinking about sex. And he's sex obsessed. And for him, sex is tied into having a lust for life. It's an interesting subject because it's not untrue. One of the weird things is that Vince is 80 years old. He was 70 something years old when he engaged in whatever relationship that he was engaged in with Janelle Grant. People are grossed out by the age differential a lot. Even before we talk about some of the details of what supposedly took place, just he was 70 and she was about 40. That grosses a lot of people out. The idea that Vince was 50, he's in his 50s and 60s, and he's on screen kissing young women grosses people out. And to him... It seems that he understands that, he knows that, and he uses it. But it doesn't quite sink in when it comes to real life. But that seems to make, that seems to me, that seems to make what makes Vince McMahon who he is. If he was normal, the WWF might have gone out of business in 1995. But he's not normal. If Vince did not listen to his audience, and provide more sexual content, maybe the company isn't around today. If he didn't, quote-unquote, exploit women, would the company still be around? If he didn't exploit women, then Sable wouldn't exist. Actor Mazzara wouldn't have happened. Trish Stratus wouldn't exist. And a lot of his drama and his troubles would not have occurred. So the exploitation of women is tied up in the that Vince listened to the audience, 
put himself, his poor dick discipline, in contact with these beautiful fitness models, these Playboy playmates, and he couldn't help himself. He had to at least do something on screen with them. And the crowd cheered it, booed it, was disgusted by it, but ultimately realized it's just on screen. But now the stuff's starting to link off screen. And people are saying, well, there's no difference. There's no difference between Vince McMahon on screen, the Vince McMahon off screen. And he's trying to say that there is. He has no similarities with the Mr. McMahon character. Well, that's very hard to see, especially when you talk about it through the, the lens of women. That Vince McMahon on screen has his way with any woman he wants, and any woman who's against him gets destroyed. And then you see, outside of the ring, pretty much the same thing happen. But that's also the but that's also the but that's also the, the perspective you get while you watch the documentary, just saying. And I completely understand why Vince was a little agitated about this documentary. It was episode six that did it. But that's episode three. That's part three of the Vince McMahon Breakdown. Hit that like and subscribe button. Let me know you guys' thoughts. I will see y'all tomorrow with part four of the Vince McMahon Breakdown. This is Primetime James Thomas, and I am out. Peace.